Hi, and welcome to this podcast. My name is Carrie Hyde, and I am your host and your pet's life coach. Today, we are going to be talking about herbs. And if you watched our last episode last week, then you know we talked about Wilma, who was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, and how her fireman turned herbalist saved her life. But today, we're going to bring on an expert, a veterinarian expert, and we're going to be talking about herbs specifically to certain conditions that we see often in our pets. So today, I also brought back Elizabeth Newton, as you remember from last week. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Good to be back. So Elizabeth is back on because she's going to be an extension into that herbalism that we really want to get dive deep into. Elizabeth drove all the way up here. She was actually at the spa probably bathing some dogs today. So <laughs> <laughs> she's up here today, and we're going to do this and talk a lot more. Uh, we're going to be talking about pancreatitis. We're going to be talking about inflammation and hopefully have some time to get into some anxiety and some other conditions that are, in my opinion, an epidemic that our pets are facing. So without further ado, though, I am so proud to have in, well, through Skype in our studio today, what I would like everybody to welcome Dr. Chris Vicent. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Great. It's Great. a beautiful fall day in Wisconsin, so it's, it's fabulous. That's awesome. So, Dr. Besant, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about your background and, um, you know, how long you've been a veterinarian and some of the amazing degrees that you have? Yeah, um, it, it, my story is kind of interesting. I... I'm a veterinarian and have been a veterinarian for 30 years. Wow. And I didn't really get into herbalism. Um, it, it, it really, for me, it came as a quest to be able to help every patient that came my way. And my natural tendency is to go with something more um, food based or herb based versus jumping into like a full-blown surgery. So what happened as a young veterinarian, I kept getting presented with these cases that I couldn't fix with medicine and I couldn't fix with traditional medicine or surgeries. And so then I started exploring other things and I explored veterinary chiropractic, veterinary acupuncture, Chinese, Chinese herbology, and got certified by the, um, the best um, teaching institutions possible on those things. And interestingly, as a veterinarian, I practiced for six months and didn't charge a soul oh. and said, just give me your honest opinion. I can guarantee you that I won't hurt your pet and that I'm fully trained in all of these modalities, but I didn't want to risk my veterinary degree on a fad. Right. And so I treated all these patients and the owners all came back to me and said my pet has never been better than wow. they are now and at that point I said yeah this is not just a fad this really has application in veterinary medicine how long and ago so was that I, say it again how long ago was that gosh that would have been 20 years ago wow yeah so long before every, anybody even thought of using herbs and animals you know, still to this day, um, veterinary chiropractic is thought of as unusual, but boy, <laughs> it just makes so much sense. Yeah. And so with that, it just, it was just obvious to me that there was a need for something, something more gentle, something with less side effects, something that had an effect that would help to change these these issues that animals were having, but without all the toxic and negative side effects of pharmaceuticals. And so I'm a, a, I'm a veterinarian. I'm, you know, graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with my veterinary degree in 88. Um, I then went on and did uh, a postdoctorate degrees in veterinary chiropractic, in veterinary acupuncture, and veterinary herbology, as well as I'm a diplomat of oriental medicine for humans, oh, so, wow. and a licensed acupuncturist. And, and interestingly, not that I was interested in ever treating people, because yeah. I love animals, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what I wanted to do was make sure that I wasn't missing something for the animals which 
because they can't speak to us, we have to just kind of watch what they do and get an idea of what's going on with them based on how they behave. And so I wanted to see when the human could tell us things, could I then kind of extrapolate that to animals? So oh, for that's one brilliant. Example, yeah, that's one brilliant. example of it is um, older people get ringing in the ears. Uh-huh. And older dogs will love to have their ears pressed on. Right. And they'll oftentimes like push their ears up against the couch. And, and that, in my opinion, is probably ringing in their ears. Huh. They can't say it to us, right. but they're behaving just like a human would when they have tinnitus or ringing in the ears. So wow. anyhow, I'm a board certified in a board certified diplomat of oriental medicine in human medicine and have as much expertise as you could imagine in veterinary medicine. And then I practiced for 30 years. So what I bring to you is not only a wealth of information on all these modalities, but then also clinical practice that I've done in practice as well to to make sure that they're working the way that you would expect them to be. That's that. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing that you, you recognized, you know, if I do this with humans and they can talk to me that maybe I can see, it's just amazing. I don't know that I've ever heard of a veterinarian doing that. That's so, I'm so impressed right now. There's, that, a, there's another really interesting story that of a dog who um, kept gulping and she would gulp and gulp and gulp and, and the owner was like beside themselves. She was licking the furniture and licking the carpet and gulping nonstop and to the point that they wanted to put this dog to sleep because oh all the endoscopic exam and the radiographs, everything, nothing showed anything. Well, from a Chinese perspective, there's a thing called a plum pit feeling in your, in your throat, which is liver chi stagnation. So we gave her the herbs for that liver chi stagnation and the plum pit feeling went away. Dog is 100% fine. Wow. So an example of a human being able to describe what they feel Mm -hmm. and a dog can't but we had to kind of extrapolate from what the dog was doing so so there were some neat Uh, applications that's uh, that's uh, that's so amazing that's great so we're gonna um kind of start talking about inflammation i think we should probably start with Mm -hmm. inflammation i know that you know there's so many different types of inflammation right there's certain areas that are inflamed, the whole body can be inflamed. But let's just talk a little bit about, um, well, actually, let me back up. Let's just talk, there's differences in herbs, right? We have Chinese herbs and we have um, Western herbs. So let's let's explain the differences between those first. Yeah, um, there are, there are very different kind of categories. So Western herbs are things like milk thistle and slippery elm and herbs that are fabulous. They are um, not as strong as pharmaceuticals, so they don't have as many negative side effects, um, but they're treating or affecting a condition. And then there's Chinese herbs, and Chinese herbs are Um, usually in formulas, so there's uh, combinations of two to 15 herbs together in a formula, and they're all based on Chinese medicine. So that tie-in symbol that that most people um, think of, that symbol is kind of this balance of yin and yang and hot and cold, and this movement of qi, which is the life force or the electricity of your body. And Chinese medicine is based on this whole other way of looking at the body and coming to a diagnosis. And then the diagnosis, just like Western medicine, the diagnosis then helps you determine what you should use for acupuncture. So what acupuncture points you might stimulate with needles, but also what herbs that you would use as well. So I I kind of do a bit of both. I'm very well versed in Chinese herbology, and yet I dabble some in Western herbs as well. But the way that I think of herbs is they're somewhere between food and drug. So we all know that functional food is helpful, right? That nutrition is the basis of health. Mm -hmm. And 
that some foods are better than, than others for particular things. And herbs are somewhere in that extension before you get to pharmaceuticals, where pharmaceuticals are one drug put into a pill at X amount of milligrams, and it's usually a single drug, versus herbs are made up of hundreds, sometimes thousands of different active ingredients that all work in synergy together that the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Right. And with that, wow. you have some things in herbs that help to dampen any of the negative side effects. So the, what I found as a practicing veterinarian is I wouldn't throw away pharmaceuticals at all. Pharmaceuticals are fabulous when we need them. Yeah. But I, it, when you have other tools in your toolbox, like I have herbs and acupuncture and chiropractic and talking nutrition, I can use all of those less uh, toxic tools first yeah. and try to use those uh, more actively in my practice. But when they, when you need an antibiotic, thank God that we have them. Yeah. Um, so it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it's using all of it. Yeah. And I think that's important, you know, because I think people want to put us in these groups, right? Like you're an herbalist, oh, so you would never take an antibiotic. Or for me, because I don't, I'm not a, a fan of the Bordetella vaccine, that means I'm an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> like, I don't get yeah. to be, you know, holistic and understand what that whole word means. And instead we get grouped. So I think it's super important that your veterinarian has all these tools in their toolbox. And when you decide you want to go to a veterinarian, I think it's super important that we ask what their toolbox is. What do you have in your toolbox? Do you have, you know, chiropractic, uh, ozone therapy, like all of these different things? Because yeah. without them, you're limited. Boom, I just go to the antibiotic. And I, it, that can be a really dangerous thing. So I think that's and important. The thing is in, in, in this day and age, most people with pets can have multiple specialists, you know? So I always, all of my clients also had their regular vet too. Yeah. So the regular vet could, could deal with things like their blood tests and those sorts of things or x-rays and, and I'm gonna look at it from my perspective. So right. the beauty is if your vet doesn't have all those things in the toolbox, that's okay. Yeah. There's always another veterinarian out there that does. and. Hopefully, we can all work together yeah. for the benefit of that animal. And and I've really found that that is the case um, yeah. because veterinarians really just want their pet their patients to be healthy. Sure. And so most veterinarians are totally willing to work with an herbalist or an acupuncturist or a chiropractor. Yeah. That's interesting. I was going to ask you what the response from the veterinary community has been to looking into maybe non-traditional, for lack of a better word, uh, methods. Yeah, I think that, that when I first started, <laughs> I was kind of the voodoo vet. And, <laughs> and, but what happened in my area is that all these naysayers saw that patients that came to me got better. Mm. And so, so what they said is there must be, we don't know what she does and we don't understand Chinese medicine, but what we see is that these patients get better and they yeah. feel better. So I literally had um, the oncology department of UW-Madison sending cancer patients to me because wow. cancer patients that got acupuncture and got herbs and we discussed food healed so much better and they lived a longer higher quality of life than patients that didn't get that so i think we're very fortunate in this day and age that if your veterinarian is resistant to it they're behind the times because most veterinarians are perfectly happy to work together that's good to hear i'm, yeah. I'm a little surprised to be honest but that's that's really good to hear I I'm just going to yeah. have to interject there and say, I think it might depend on what area you're in. That, that's um, true. <laughs> you're right. Because I'm, I unfortunately am not really in my area finding that to be too true. Mm. Um, but I definitely think it's a conversation you have to have with your vet. And if they aren't, if that is the route you want to go, 
and your vet wants to be resistant to it, you're unfortunately, they don't have to be the one doing it, but if they're resistant to it, you're, you're going to have to find a vet that will work with another veterinarian and do this kind of stuff, or you're just going to, that stress alone is going to make it harder for your pet to heal, right? If you're bringing that stress and you're not sure how you want to handle it and you've got two people pulling you, that, that's not going to let your pet heal. So we got to find those vets that are willing to work. So, um, okay, so let's, let's start talking about like inflammation in the body and, and what, what all that means. I mean, I think a lot of times when people think about inflammation, they think about, you know, the dog limping or he hurt his leg or, you know, yeah, like arthritis, but inflammation, tell us a little bit more about what inflammation can lead to. Yeah, I think that, um, the, the more I've practiced and the more I've used all these tools, I think that inflammation can be global within the whole body. Yeah. So to me, I look at um, the, the body of the animal as like nature. And that if you have like the burning fires in, in California, that if you have this kind of internal environment that's too hot, and too inflamed that you're going to get flare-ups here and flare-ups there. So what I saw as a veterinarian is that if I just treated the flare-up, so let's say a dog has a bladder infection, and I treat with antibiotics to kill the bacteria that's in the bladder, but I don't take it the next step further and decrease the inflammation of the bladder wall, the bladder infection is going to come back again. Um, because the environment is set up for bacteria to grow for inflammation to happen. So my approach is to take it that next step further. So I would treat, uh, for example, a dog with bladder infections with the antibiotics. Absolutely, you got to kill the bacteria. But then I would also add like D-mannose and cranberry and some really wonderful herbs that decrease the heat and the inflammation of the bladder as well. And then I would take a a next step further and say, why did this fire flare up? What's going on in the rest of this dog's body that is kind of a pro-inflammatory state? So what I found is that American dogs that are eating 90% plus eat dry, hard kibble. And that dry, hard, high carbohydrate kibble leads to a pro-inflammatory state. Mm -hmm. And so, so many animals are, have allergies and allergies are inflammation of the skin, bladder infections, inflammation of the bladder. Um, Gosh, just about, just about the majority of chronic diseases are inflammation somewhere in the body that we're looking at one single thing, but really what we should be doing is looking at the whole. So if you take those dogs off of the uh, pro-inflammatory kibble, so lower their carbohydrates, add in some er or some foods that are more cooling in nature, so um, fresh meats and vegetables and some fruits, but you know, species appropriate, of course that helps to bring down this global inflammation that that is happening throughout the body. And I don't think Western medicine, we don't think that. We think that- Definitely not. There's that same dog could have a bladder infection. We treat the bladder infection. And that same dog also has um, skin allergies. And so we give them steroids for the skin allergies, which only blows up the inflammation even more. And they continue to feed the hard, dry, um, high carbohydrate kibble, and you really need to to look at the animal as a whole and bring all that inflammation down. Yeah, I think that is the 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 biggest problem is our mindset goes to that instant, you know, oh bladder infection, antibiotic, and it just becomes very routine. And very rarely do I hear clients telling me that their veterinarians are looking further and past. So it's only here. It's not what caused it. It's not how to prevent it. It's just how to treat it. And, and prevention, you know, is a, is a little bit of work because you have to change your mindset, right? We have to change our mindsets that food looks like something hard that we pour into our bowls. 
Um, <laughs> and, and that's hard. It's hard because, you know, we've been told for years that that's what cleans their teeth, which I still can't wrap my head around how I fell for that one 35 years ago, but I did. And I used to tell people that you had, you know, I was a vet tech for 12 years and I sold a lot of kibble and, and that was one of the arguments I'm embarrassed to say that even I thought was what we did. Well, that's what you were taught. It was what I was taught and it made sense. It was crunchy and it, but now I, someone said to me that we had a dental hygienist come on and he said, yeah, that's like me telling you to clean your teeth with a Chips Ahoy. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it is. That's a good <laughs> analogy. <laughs> it absolutely is. Can you imagine? So, but yeah. I, you're absolutely yeah. right. We have to look at the before and the after, which may be way more important than the now, right? Like yeah, the preventative and, it's, and, the, and it's looking a little bit deeper and saying, why, is, why are all these inflammatory things happening? Is it just a unhealthy, poorly thriving dog, or is it something deeper than that? And I would put pancreatitis in that same category, that sure. dogs that have pancreatitis oftentimes have pancreatitis because of the amount of carbohydrates that are in their diet versus the amount of fats in their diet. And I would say, it's one more example of an inflammatory process happening in this dog's body. So pancreatitis, so I, you know, I left the veterinary field almost, tw well, almost 21 years ago. And back then, I swear to you, we hardly ever saw pancreatitis. Hmm. We, it it oh, wasn't, I mean, it, we just, now it is almost every dog that comes into my shop and I, I mean, we have a, uh, Elizabeth and I have a nutrition store and so we don't sell kibble and all we have is whole fresh foods but people come in all the time and tell me I can't feed my dog that because my dog has pancreatitis and he has to eat a low fat so they just want to flip the bags over and look for their low fat diet but I got to yep. tell you pancreatitis is an epidemic if I'm only to use my little store in Tustin California it's an epidemic and it, it and it's inflammation. So what do we like, like, let's start talking about herbs to get rid of inflammation in the body and see, yeah. see what that looks like. Well, there's kind of a couple. Um, and that goes with the, um, the Chinese theory that complete health is this balance of yin and yang. So yang is outward, aggressive, active movement and heat. And yin is quiet, maternal, nighttime fluids of the body. I love yin. And then you need to have <laughs> balance of both. So you need to be, you need to get up in the morning and go about your day and have the metabolism to digest the food that you eat. But you also need to settle down at night and when, the, when it's dark, snuggle up in your bed and fall deep into a dream sleep and and wake up in the morning refreshed. So you need this balance of yin to yang. The other major concept in Chinese herbs is that you need to have movement of qi. Mm -hmm. So qi moves throughout our body and our pet's body on a 24 hour basis. So um, it's com coming from your hand, going up your arm, down your body to the leg, then back up and it just is moving throughout your body throughout I just the day. I want to move with her. <laughs> and so inflammation can happen because either one of those are out of balance. So for example, arthritis is an obstruction of the flow of qi, which is that this movement, the steady movement is then hindered. So for example, a dog that has Lyme's disease in his hock, for example, so the biggest joint of the hind leg, it, because of that inflammation, chi doesn't move evenly and you get this kind of throbbing pain. And that throbbing pain from a Chinese perspective is considered um, obstruction of the flow of chi. And so you would use herbs that would even out that flow again. So um, some of those herbs are, uh, we produce one in, with Herbsmith called Comfort Aches. And so it's frankincense and myrrh and carthamus and acaranthes, noted ginseng, and then also um, angelica dongwai, which is all about moving blood and moving chi throughout the body. Then you can also look at it and say, okay, 
if you have too much yang and not enough yin, what what are you going to do? It makes sense, and you want a balance. So you want even an uh, even balance of yin and yang. That's complete health. So in that dog with pancreatitis, the yang is too high. So the inflammation of the body is too high. You need some inflammation because inflammation is actually a healing process, and you want some inflammation. You just don't want it out of control. You don't want it, you know, running throughout the body willy-nilly and setting up these flames throughout the body. So you want to use herbs that are really cooling and bring down the heat. From a Western perspective, we would call, we would say that they're, if you look at the actual chemical changes that happen within the body on cooling herbs, they're really anti-inflammatory and pain relieving. So they affect the COX enzymes and 5-lipooxygenase and all the inflammatory things that happen with inflammation. Chinese medicine just thinks of it differently. They just think of everything kind of more naturistic. So for inflammation, you bring down that heat and bring down that inflammation. Well, then here's where it gets a little bit more difficult. So this is yang and this is yin. So this is to heat and this is fluids. And what happens is slowly but surely, heat that's too high is going to burn away the fluids. Mm-hmm. So from Chinese medicine, it's not just about bringing down the heat. It's also about re-nourishing the body again and bringing up the yin or the fluids to get back to health. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, a, a formula that um, that we use at Herbsmith is called Soothe Joints. And Soothe Joints is this amazing formula that's been used for thousands of years in, in Chinese medicine that is all about moving blood and moving qi and raising yin, but also saying that these older pets generally have lower qi and you want to raise their whole level of energy as well. So you see that formula would tend to be used in dogs that get worse when it's cold and damp. They tend to have more gray around their muzzles or graying of their eyes. That's all slowly but sure depletion of chi that just happens as we age. It's just a, a, a normal process. So that's what I really loved about Chinese medicine. It was so much more than just, boom, anti-inflammatory and you're done with it. It's, it's trying to rebalance the body, whether it's the movement of qi or this balance of yin and yang. Does it take a long time to balance the body? If you, if you had a dog, I'll just give you, because I know every dog is different. Let's talk about a dog who had pancreatitis and arthritis and maybe had it for about a year. And, and got how the, old is he? And let's say he's six, okay? So six. not a puppy, not super old. And let's say he's on the right, we got him on the right diet. Okay, he's now eating a biologically appropriate, awesome diet. Um, but how long do you think it would take if you're trying to balance these? Does it take for the body to balance with herbs? Is it a year? Um, Is it overnight? Is it um, weeks? Weeks. Okay. Weeks. But to me, that's pretty darn. That's quick. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say that dog who's six years old, so he has like good, vibrant, healthy chi. He has a good foundation of health. He, so he can respond well to the herbs. Um, and then you would use herbs that the arthritis is not moving blood and chi. So you would use herbs that are moving blood and chi. And the pancreatitis is a, a whole nother concept in Chinese medicine where chi isn't moving downwards in the GI tract. And so you use really great herbs that decrease the heat and the inflammation of the pancreas. And so to me, it's pancreatitis is very similar to the bladder infection. It's just another flare up in the body. So that young, vibrant dog who's on a good plane of nutrition, and that is huge. Nutrition is the foundation of all health. If he's on a good plane of nutrition, has a great vibrant chi, within weeks, weeks, that dog can be dramatically better. That's amazing. And in, if you don't, it will continue on. So first it's pancreatitis, then it's diarrheas, then it's 
skin allergies, then it's itchy ears, and then it's impacted anal sacs, and it just keeps on going until you do something to change that internal environment. Now, it's possible they could change it on their own because the body's always trying to right itself. Homeostasis that we talk about in Western medicine or just in medicine in general, absolutely. Homeostasis or this evening of chi is the ultimate goal of all creatures' bodies. Sometimes we need to use herbs or acupuncture or food to kind of push it in the right direction. Wow, it's just, it, it's, it's so amazing. How, how would a pet parent know if, I mean, I know you're talking a lot about kind of doing both, right? Bringing up and bringing down, but how would a pet parent know if, if their pet is too high? Like, I know we have the symptom, right? We have pancreatitis, but how do I know I have a cooling pet or I have one that's, that's hot? How do I know to do what to do with that? Yeah, one of my best, um, one of the things that my clients always came to me with is when I asked them, where does this dog want to sleep? Mm -hmm. Do they like to sleep on the cold tile floor or do they like to sleep in front of the fireplace? And that really tells you a lot. What are they seeking? Because what they're trying to do is take their internal nature and use external nature to try to balance themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the best way to, that I think of that very practical that we see every day is what would you choose to eat in the winter time? And what would you choose to eat in the summertime? So in the summertime, you're going to ch choose to eat fruits and vegetables and cooling things because it's so hot in the world. And that heat is coming into you and into your body in the winter time at least in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I bet in Wisconsin. And so I want to go home and eat a hot stew or eat um, soups because that's going to warm me internally. And so for a pet, what you see is because they can't choose a hot food or a cold food, they're going to choose the place that they live. So little chihuahuas, for example, that live in Wisconsin, they love to be <laughs> underneath the covers. Yeah. because they're so cold and they want to develop that heat. So that's my first question is, is where do they tend to sleep? And then there's other things that when you describe it is pretty obvious. Like, are they cold to the touch or are they hot to the touch? Mm -hmm. And people with um, animals that have skin allergies, that heat is just radiating from that dog. So they're way, way, way too hot. Or it's also, is that dog the kind that's running, 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 running? That's too much heat, too much yawn. And the dog who's too cold will tend to just plop in one place and just stays there all day. They're more contracted, more still, that's more cold. So it's really obvious observational sort of things that tell you if they're, warm, if they're too warm or they're too cold. And then we want to use things like their environment, but also food to try to balance this, herbs to try to balance them. So kind of use things to bring them back in, in the right um, balance of yin and yang. So we talked a lot about that hot and flame dog that has all these flare ups here and there. Those dogs are gonna sleep on the tile floor. Those dogs are hot to the touch. And even after they have the bladder infection and they get antibiotics, they're still hot to the touch. They're still hot and inflamed. So what kind of herbs would you give a, a hot dog or a hot cat if you, if, you, if you only had one herb to give and you couldn't find it anywhere besides me telling them to go to Herb Smith? <laughs> what, <laughs> but you're desperate. Um, what, 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 what's a cooling herb and what's a, a warming herb, for example? Yeah, a, a cooling herb that I would use is called Scutellaria. Um, that is a really fabulous cooling er herb, or Buporum, which is chapu. Um, those are really cooling herbs, or Coptus, Huang Lian, are great cooling herbs. And then for warming herbs, it's really simple stuff, like ginger. Oh, wow. And mm -hmm. cinnamon. Yeah. And ginseng. You know, all things that are kind of more towards 
you can see that the things that are more nourishing and warming tend to be more food-like, and the things that are more anti-inflammatory and um, bringing down inflammation tend to be more drug-like. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting to me. I don't know why I never considered cinnamon an herb. I, I just <laughs> didn't. I don't know. I, I, I'm... No. I'm so early in my learning of herbs and what's going on. I focused on nutrition for so long. I think I just didn't really. Well, everything else stems from nutrition. Yeah. I mean, without that basis, we're, yeah. we're doomed. Yeah. So it's just, it, it's, I'm, I'm loving this because, and I know Elizabeth is so excited about it. So if we go back to pancreatitis. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, pancreatitis is actually more of a, um, Nutritional abuse with high carbohydrate is what I think. I agree. And if you look at dogs that are eating a species appropriate diet and their um, amylase level, so it's the digestive enzyme that breaks down starches or sugars or carbohydrates, and say it's at zero. When you look at dogs that have been eating chronic kibble, so kibble generally has a 40% carbohydrate content, those dogs have eight and a half times the amount of amylase being released from the pancreas. Jeez. Now what's going to cause inflammation is this organ in overdrive over and over and over and over and over. And I think that the reason that um, the veterinary community kind of has not really thought of that and is really thinking more about fat content is that lipase um, stays in the bloodstream longer. So when you diagnose pancreatitis, you diagnose it by diagnosing high levels of lipase. Hmm. It doesn't mean that's the inciting feature. It means that's something that is in the bloodstream longer, so it's easier for a veterinarian to be able to diagnose it. So everybody's like, ooh, I gotta decrease the amount of fat in the diet. And I would say the opposite, because if you look at raw fed dogs, raw fed dogs that are getting fed um, organ meat and skeletal meat, they have high fat content. And yeah. you never see pancreatitis in my, dogs that have that are fed raw. You my just don't. own I mean, dogs you can literally yep. eat thirty to forty to fifty percent fat and be just fine for yep. long term. So that's what really made me go, Oh, there's yeah. something else here. And I think it's the high carbohydrate diet that is overtaxing the pancreas so eventually the pancreas gives in and becomes inflamed and once it becomes inflamed then you have the whole pancreatic crisis and the vomiting and the diarrhea and the abdominal pain and and yeah. all the horrible things of acute pancreatitis but i think there's a lot of chronic low-grade pancreatitis that we don't really even diagnose. But right. what I see it as, as a holistic veterinarian, is those dogs with um, sensitive stomachs. Mm. And sometimes they vomit and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they have diarrhea and sometimes they don't. And they have gurgly guts that you can just hear them gurgling when you give something wrong. And what is the percentage of those dogs? Gosh, I would say, 50 to 60% of dogs have some of that sensitive stomach. And I think the reason is, is that they're tilting on the borderline of that pancreas being able to produce enough amylase. And yeah. that really kind of came down from observational of looking at the health of a raw fed dog, dogs being fed real food, whole food, organ and skeletal meat, which has high percentages of fat dogs that are being fed kibble, that is a high percent of carbohydrate, and then the fat that is in that kibble is sprayed on the outside to convince dogs that this is actually food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so is that, I think there's a huge difference between healthy fat and unhealthy fat as well. Sure. And so you put high carbohydrate diet and unhealthy fat, chronic pancreatitis. Yep. So mm -hmm. um, what I would do is my immediate is, change their diet. You need to go to a whole food, healthy diet, and I don't think that you need to lower the the, the fat level initially. It's a yeah. lowering the carbohydrate level. No, you I might agree. have to slowly build up the fat because the, because the 
the whole pancreas is inflamed. The whole pancreas has been beat up, essentially. And so you do have to slowly bring them up. But a healthy, vibrant dog, you don't have to worry about that at all. And then I do use Chinese herbs in pancreas, um, dogs with pancreatitis. And the herbs that I use, it's called Shaoyao San, and we produce it Wait, as say that, a, say that again? <laughs> Slower. <laughs> Shaoyao San. Okay. So it's X-I-A-O, new word, Y-A-O, new okay. word, S-A-N. We'll put that in the show and, notes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really great combination of herbs that decreases the heat and inflammation of the GI tract and helps to bring down the inflammation that's in the, um, that's in the pancreas as well. So I would use like slippery elm. And slippery elm is great because it's kind of a mucilage. So it protects mm -hmm. the outer lining of the, or inner lining of the stomach and of the small intestine and of the pancreas. And then I would use gastrocare, which is shaoyosan, um, but in just an easier way to say it, I would use gastrocare in those pets as well to bring down that heat and inflammation and take it further than just the acute pancreatic attack and take it to the inflammation throughout their body and certainly doing that with a low carbohydrate diet. Yeah, so I, I you know, it, it's a struggle for me because I'm not a veterinarian and I someday should go get that license. But anyway, I, when people come to me and they've got pancreatitis and they're frustrated and they're struggling and their vet's not helping them, then they decide to do, you know, to speak to me as a nutrition standpoint. I, it's every single time, but my vet said I can't feed them that because it's high in fat. So a lot of times what I will do to try to help them, because I recognize the more stress they have, it's not going to help their pet. So a lot of times what I will do is say, well, how about if we put you on a uh, species appropriate diet and I'll pick a commercial diet necessarily. And then what I'll do is I'll take like, I don't know if you know about like green juju. Um, that's a, like a, you know what I'm talking about? A green juju is a, yeah. um, yeah. it's a mixture of a bunch of veggies and they grind it together. Yeah. And so then what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, we'll lower the fat for you and we'll do that by, it, it, are you okay with that? Cause I will do that to help the Absolutely. client feel comfortable and also get the pet on a better diet. So I'll lower the fat through veggies and still give them yep. a whole fresh diet. So mm -hmm. I think that, that we, can, we can pick a medium here <laughs> somewhere if we have to. Um, but I agree with you. I think non-soluble carbohydrates are killing our animals and making them enormously sick. And I, 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 they're cheap and they're easily put into foods and that's why they you know, sell very well. But it, I think you're right. I think that's the problem with, I think kibble, right? How hard is it for the pancreas to break down kibble if you're feeding your dog twice a day a bowl of kibble? That first bowl of kibble probably doesn't get broken down by the pancreas for two days. Well, it, it's about transit time through the stomach. So, so they're eating this bowl of hard, dry kibble that goes down into the stomach, and then hopefully they're drinking some water that helps to break it down into like a paste right. and a dough. And then, and then slowly but surely it starts to move through the body. But based on the composition of what that slurry is, is what the pancreas has to release to try to break that down. Because if it gets past the small intestine and starts going into the colon, then it starts to feed the bad bacteria. So then you get this whole microbiome issue where you have really bad bacteria growing and not good bacteria growing. And that now you have that pancreatitis dog who has chronic diarrhea mm -hmm. as well because now the microbiome has been messed up too. Right. Um, so the other thing I'd like to do with pancreatic dogs is add some digestive enzymes to their diet. And uh, we do it through Microflora, the product that HerbSmith makes that mm -hmm. has probiotics and prebiotics and digestive enzymes and herbs. But the digestive enzymes help to kind of lighten the load on the pancreas. So if the pancreas is inflamed and can't be responding the way that it should, but dogs still need to eat, right. at least if we give them some digestive enzymes with the food, it helps to break it down more so that they can absorb it better without 
um, taxing the, the pancreas even more. Yeah. But there's, you know, many other ways you can get digestive enzymes as well. But, you know, that's a whole nother. Right. I know, I know some. Microbiome. Yeah. Some foods, um, I know they say have digestive enzymes in as well, but sometimes your dog won't eat it. So yeah. if you want to give your dog papaya and he won't eat it, you have to find an herb or another way to get it in their body. And, yep. and, and so it is unfortunate that, cause I'm a huge believer that we can get a lot from our food, but it's different when you have a person that you can say, look, eat this or die. Cause a dog will be like, I don't care. I don't <laughs> like it. I'm not eating it. So that's where supplements and herbs and these things that we can kind of hide in their foods become absolutely beneficial in order for survival sometimes, unfortunately, that we need to do. So, yeah. And I think that other part for dogs is that the dog parent having a dog go through an acute pancreatic um, episode is scary. scary. Yeah. It's really scary. And dogs can die from it. Yeah, absolutely. So it is not as simple as just a sensitive stomach. It is an acute yeah. Painful, painful, traumatic experience for the owner and for the dog. So I love your approach to um, using the juju and the fresh vegetables to lower the fat content because even though fat wasn't the primary source of it, you certainly want to lighten the load for the pancreas. Sure. And the beauty is the way that you're approaching it is then that owner is going to see the effects of whole food. Sure. And hopefully never go back to the brown, dry, hard carbo- high <laughs> carbohydrate kibble again when you could be eating vibrant, healthy food. Right, right. Now, would I be correct in this? Did I understand you to say that if a, we have a puppy and we're raising it with a species-appropriate diet, the, the type that Carrie would recommend from the beginning, we're going to almost never see these incidents. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. Yes, 100%. I would say that so many chronic diseases can be completely resolved by proper nutrition. And, you know, my big thing and the whole reason I do stuff like this and talk to you guys is not to just you guys, but just in general. Right, right. Try to get that message out there is... If we've domesticated animals, then we need to feed them the way that they should be fed. And the way that the majority of pets are being fed today is just so wrong. And And I saw it over and over and over and over again in my practice that dogs that ate well from the time they were young lived healthy, vibrant, long, fabulous lives. And you didn't need any veterinary care because they didn't get sick. Yes, and yes. if you look at the majority of diseases that animals get, they get them because of the poor plane of nutrition they're on. So I, I agree with you 100%. And I always said as a veterinarian, pay me now or pay me later. You can <laughs> right. either feed your dog healthy food throughout their lives and right. never see me, but yeah. know I'm there if I, you need my help. Or you can feed them crap that's really cheap, and then if you love your dog, you're going to pay later yeah. in in all the medicines that you're going to need to try to keep them good and the the lifespan is not going to be as long either. Or right. wouldn't you even say, like I would say this because I see it all the time, but it's, it's feed your dog healthy and never see me again or feed your dog junk food and I'll see you every month. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and 100%. I'll see you every month. I cannot believe how many of my clients go to their veterinarians once a month for their Cytopoint, for their arthritis pills, for their antibiotics. For, they spend so much money on veterinarian care, and they ask me all the time, and I think, where do, what and vet I think do you go to? The part about that is these are wonderful people. Sure. These are wonderful pet people that want to do the best for their animals sure. possible, but they're not being directed the correct right. way. So people like you guys are like really leading the charge that, you know, veterinarians were really trained to treat disease. So when you go to the vet, they say, what's your problem? And you say, he's doing this or he's doing that. And then, and our way of thinking, the way we were academically trained was how to stop that from happening. So he's peeing in the house because he has his bladder infection or he's vomiting in the corner because he has 
chronic pancreatitis. So as a veterinarian, we just want to stop that symptom from occurring. But we're really not trained in, in long-term health and being proactive and maintaining your dog's long-term care. We're just not. We're trained to treat a disease or to treat a problem. And I, what I saw is that there's this disparity. Right now, who's talking about pet nutrition and pet health? People like you guys and super, certainly really good stores, but that's few and far between. It is. You know, it, it, you guys are rare. And so most pet owners have to rely on big pet food right. to feed their dogs because they don't know any better. And then we got convinced that, God forbid, if they're doing okay on that, never, ever change it. That's just craziness. Yeah, but if your vet is so busy treating disease, they don't have the time or the interest, and they're not trained in providing long-term health and wellness. And so there's this there's this place that's not being fulfilled by the veterinary community. And thank God people like you are stepping up and saying, this is craziness, this is what we sh should do. But unfortunately, it, it, they're few and far between. Yeah, we're, we're, I've seen some shifts. In 2008, we had one of the largest recalls in this country and thousands of pets died. And I, was just in the beginning stages of my, because I had left the veterinary world, and so I was already on the path, the right path, but still learning. Um, and then 2008 hit, and suddenly people were interested in what was going in their pet's mouths. There still was a long road to go, because that just meant go from this kibble to this kibble, as I like to say, go from McDonald's to Burger King to Wendy's. Um, yeah. But it... <laughs> It, but we are we are getting there. I mean, we are. I'm and finally, you know, as you know, and Sarah knows, I pulled kibble off my mart, off completely off my shelves. I don't sell it anymore. So, um, I to be able to even think to do that and still be able to survive, I think, is a, a, definitely a tribute to the fact that people like you, you, the veterinarians who are supporting this movement, which are also few and far between, unfortunately, yep. but the veterinarians yep. that are, are push, not pushing, I don't want to say pushing, that's such a negative word, but talking about herbs promoting and talking and about and promoting and encouraging this ch shift, because to have a veterinarian say, I don't want to see you in my office, is the vet I want to go to. Because yeah, it, that, is, that should be the goal, that I'm here if you need me, but I don't want to see you every month. Well, exactly. and with the veterinary, I think that when you walk into your veterinary's office and there are shelves and shelves of kibble, it's hard to even think that that might not be the best choice because sure. we are so trained to like respect authority and respect, well, this person's an expert and they're selling all this kibbles so it must be the way to go um yeah. so yeah. i i do think it's really important as you pointed out like not to shame people we're we're certainly not shaming people like they are honestly their intentions are good they're Absolutely. doing what they've been taught like you were yeah. saying you you were taught that you i was taught that you didn't know any yeah. better till no. like 20 years ago oh i could tell you i also was the one telling you to get your board of tell a shot because you know we didn't want your dog to get sick and now i would never recommend that vaccine so and i think the beauty is it's really um every healthy dog that goes to a vet that's being fed well is is an example mm. that hopefully that veterinarian's like ah oh, what's different about this something? dog <laughs> yeah. yeah why did this dog heal so well yeah you know when the, another dog eating a poor plane of nutrition didn't heal well yeah you know i always say to veterinarian veterinary friends of mine that raw food and real food diets make you look good mm -hmm. because whatever you do they're going to heal so much better yeah so you you come in and are the superstar because whatever you prescribed or did or they healed so much better than the dog that's on a really low plane well that's such an interesting top an interesting oh. statement because so many of my clients when they do ask me if i know a vet guess why they're asking me because they are frustrated that you haven't healed their dog and they come yeah. to me constantly and say, do you have another vet? Because I've been going to my vet for like the last two years and my dog's sick. That's the, you may think that you're, you know, making all this money or whatever is going on. You need to 
look at these dogs that are doing better and you know that's just my little plug on veterinarians so because well, I just how, that's how I that's yeah how I like that, that's I the quickest come way to get family or anything I I saw as I got out of veterinary school that dogs who ate well healed well yep and yep. dogs who ate well seldom had to come to see me because they were doing really fabulous and then I asked what exactly do you do and yeah. slowly but surely saw this over 30 years so it's not like I just started thinking about this a couple months ago this is 30 years of watching that yep. dogs who ate well healed well yep yep and lived well yeah absolutely so um just real quick like I know um, for our listeners, so uh, Dr. Vicente makes uh, uh, some herbs of your own. Mm -hmm. Are they, are, and it's, it's called Herb Smith, which I highly recommend that you use because it'll make it simple for you guys, a little bit easier for our listeners. But are these um, ground up herbs? Are they liquid? Are they, how, how are we giving these to dogs? Yeah, they're, most of them are all powders. And so they're literally, um, the actual herbs, so herbs could be leaves and they could be um, fruits, they could be um, all different things, roots, and they're all ground up to a powder and then mixed together. So most of them come as powder. Um, a few of them come as tablets where they're compressed. So it's literally the herbs compressed into a tablet so it's easier to give. And then we do have some in soft chew, so it's easier for um, pets to eat. Oh, perfect. But I would say that that herbs that are um, about bringing up their level of chi, so for example, there's wonderful herbs for hypothyroidism in dogs, because mm. hypothyroid is really low levels of chi. So there are these wonderful chi tonics that will raise their level of chi, and they're actually really yummy to eat. Oh, awesome. um, but the anti-inflammatory herbs are kind of bitter. And so the herbs that are really great for allergies and great for, um, oh, uh, there's a, a herbal combination, the frankincense and myrrh, that is about moving chi. Those are really bitter too. And so herbs are great for dogs because you can usually get them to eat it. So a big dog just dump the powder on their food and the Labrador is going to eat it. Uh, kitties are a whole different deal, though. Kitties are, <laughs> yes, they are. much more different. <laughs> yeah. The kitties are not going to eat a lot of herbs. But the kind of interesting thing is I've had so many um, pet parents that are like, my dog will not eat his food unless he has his herbs. That's interesting. So, so there is a bit of, of what you need, you desire. You desire. So, like, um, dogs that need anti-inflammatory herbs amazingly sometimes eat them just great which, and I'm shocked by it Yeah, but yeah it's usually a powder that you're going to put on their food and um, some is great tasting the, the ones that are bringing down the inflammation are, that are cooling are going to be a little more bitter it's so true when animals um, are seeking something I tell my clients a lot when they say you know my dog just keeps eating grass so I always tell them, make sure that the grass does not have any pesticides or anything bad on it if you know it's your grass. But it's interesting because I will take that dog and say, okay, well, let's do some green juju for a week and just test. And, and they always say, oh, yeah, he stopped eating grass. Well, his body's telling him. And so when we're talking about herbs, it makes sense that if an animal wants to eat a bitter herb, his body's probably telling him he needs it. They're smarter yeah. than we are. We just have to listen to them. And they have an amazing yeah. set. Their, their instincts are sharp because they don't have that emotional part where it tells us, no, that's stupid. They just go by their instincts. We yeah. get in the way yeah, and we need to leave it alone. So, well, I can't thank you enough. But before we go, is there like, what's your favorite herb? What's the one you use all the time? Um, frankincense. 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 One of your favorite it's, herbs. Yeah. It's also called, um, the English name for it is Boswellia. Boswellia. So frankincense and Boswellia is so fabulous because it's, um, it's moving blood and moving chi. Yeah. And it's, um, decreasing inflammation of the joint musculoskeletal. And so that's probably one of my most favorite herbs. Um, but I also love ginseng. Ginseng is an adaptogen, and it is it, it just helps to 
revive and rejuvenate um, pets. So ginseng is really pretty fabulous as well in a non-hot pet. So if they're, if they're hot and inflamed, stay away from ginseng. Is there an herb that you would recommend, like, I got a puppy, he seems healthy, he doesn't have any issues, he's eating a species appropriate diet, I'm not over vaccinating him, I'm not going to give him flea and tick medications or heartworm medications, I'm going to spay him at two, or her at two years old. Is there an herb that you think I could just, just to keep everything kind of balanced that I should give just as a start, or maybe that's not necessary and we shouldn't be just giving an uh herb? Well, probably frankincense would be one of those. Yeah. Um, so frankincense and myrrh. So we produce it in sound dog, uh, sound dog viscosity. So we put like glucosamine and chondritin and hyaluronic acid and then frankincense and myrrh in um, a combination. Because that's why people do Tai Chi and Qigong and those sort of things. And that's why exercise in moderation is so important for us to sustain health. It's about moving chi throughout your body. So anytime you have any stagnation of chi or blood in your body, you're going to have a problem there. So it could be arthritis, it could be um, tendonitis, it could be um, achy and crampy, and that's all because chi's not moving the way it should. So that's what I would say for the young dog who's healthy and vibrant and balanced and great is you can almost, almost never have too much movement of blood and chi okay. because that's a natural rhythm that they should go through all the time. And then what I would say is chances are good your dog is going to be fabulous their entire lives. Um, but then I would start to look at it like from an age perspective. So, for example, your young, healthy, vibrant dog is going to be good most of their lives. But then as they age, your natural production of endogenous antioxidants starts to go down, meaning what your body produces for antioxidants. And so in older pets, you need to start increase the dietary antioxidants because they're not making enough on their own. Hmm. So there's things like that, that I would say in the perfect world, if I was to say, this is a young, healthy, vibrant dog, what are the things that I would do to keep them there? The young, healthy one would get glucosamine and herbs that move blood and chi. They would also do things that are um, nourishing the microbiome so that they're always nourished their whole life. And then as the age, I would start adding things like um, higher dietary antioxidants and absolutely higher omega-3 contents like in krill for EPA and DHA. So I would start to look at things like that. So even though they don't have a particular issue, there's things that we want to do to help to maintain that. To maintain that. What about overdosing on herbs? Is that, is that something that you see? Is it possible to do that? It's definitely possible. Absolutely. And um, that's why the way that I look at herbs, there's herbs that are considered kind of over the counter, meaning that they're safe, they're effective, and they'll do no harm. And then there's herbs that are more like drugs that really need to be administered from a veterinarian or prescribed from a veterinarian. And the FDA doesn't really differentiate that, but I do personally um, from a responsible um, veterinarian, responsible pet owner. I would say that like Scutellaria and Coptis and Bucorum, which are more anti-inflammatory herbs, or gastrodia, which is about um, lowering the seizure threshold in dogs. Those you really need to get from your veterinarian. So we have a Herbsmith OTC, which are safe for everybody and you can't do any harm with it. And then we also have Herbsmith RX, which are a many, many different herbal formulas for all sorts of veterinary issues that really need veterinary consultation to go with it. And we don't sell those to the general public because that's where you would go wrong. Right. That goes to a veterinarian and a veterinarian needs to do a full physical exam, do the blood work, do the x-rays, know exactly what they're treating, and then pick these stronger herbs to be able to help treat it so that they don't have to go to the pharmaceuticals. Okay. That is so awesome. You are so amazing. Elizabeth, do you have any other questions or? 
gosh, I could honestly, I could just probably five or six hours. <laughs> I know we're going to have to do another episode for sure. We will do another episode on some herbs and stuff. So just to recap, we talked about pancreatitis. So what is the, what are we going to, what, I know Herb Smith makes one. So even though I want our audience to know, we're not big on being salesy, but let's just sure. cut it, nip it in the bud. What, what product would you give a dog who's suffering from your product? It's, from Herb Smith, which one is it? What's it called? Um, it, I, number one, it would be your nutrition. That's Thanks. absolutely number one more than anything else is nutrition and species appropriate diets. Right. Then it would be uh, microflora to ha that has digestions to decrease the load on the pancreas, slippery elm that is going to kind of make the GI oh. tract more slippery and protect the inflamed inner lining of the GI tract. Mm -hmm. And then gastrocare. And gastrocare is that really great formulation of Chinese herbs that decrease heat and inflammation and have qi move down the GI tract. And do you make one that has all those in it? No. No, unfortunately so not. There are three different products. Okay. Um, and what I would say is that dogs with pancreatitis are very reactive. So I would get one and slowly but surely start them out on it. Then I would get the other, slowly but surely start. And then expect that it's going to be four to six weeks before you're at full dose on all of them. Okay. And Which one would you start it, with? It depends on the animal. But I'd probably start with microflora first and slippery elm. And then go to the gastro care. Okay. And what I would do is I would, um, when you educate people that pancreatitis is just the tip of the iceberg, that inflammation sure. is just the beginning and that you have all of this underneath the water that we need to resolve and that this long-term perspective of using herbs for six to eight to 12 months is really what you're going for. It's not the immediate, you're not giving a drug and the next day they're going to be better. Right. It right. is life food where you're changing the internal environment and it's a it's a long-term play not a short term right That's awesome another thing we see a, a lot of prob probably one of the things other than skin issues that i think i run into the most is anxiety oh yeah anxiety is is huge and you you mentioned frankincense several times i've always thought of that um in addition to anti-inflammation and stuff as a kind of a mood stabilizer would that be yeah. helpful in kind of maintaining yeah. um, mental health, if you will, for or mood stabilization yeah. throughout their lives? Yeah, anxiety is such a big, uh, such a big deal for pets, and I would kind of look at it from two perspectives. One is um, using a short-term herbs that decrease the anxiety. So mm -hmm. it'd be like things like tryptophan and chamomile and passion flower, um, valerian. Yes, are yes. all fabulous herbs that bring down that anxious state. But they're almost a bit like tranquilizers because they only work for a short time. Mm -hmm. So those would, be, um, those would be something that you would use on July 3rd. Right. When you know that this craziness is going to begin. But then there's a whole nother group of herbs that have anti-anxiety properties that are all about changing serotonin and dopamine levels in the brain and have anti-anxiety properties. And those are ones that you give, you know, every single day and expect that you're going to see a difference like in two weeks or in four weeks. Right. And that by next year, your dog is going to be so much better than they are now. Um, and I tend to use both of those together. So I use the quick acting herbs together with more of a anti-anxiety, more long acting herbs. So one of a, a really good long acting herb would be Zizifus. And Zizifus is <laughs> sour so jujube. And it's, it's just a really great herb to bring down heat and inflammation. And Long yen ru, which is um, long yen fruit. So if you go to a Chinese market, you'll find long yen fruit. And long yen fruit is like really great to help bring down that anxiety as well. And, and then certainly, again, the foundation of health, 
get them off a pro-inflammatory diet. Yep, yep, it always comes Ooh. back to that, I know. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna have you have you back on the show sometime soon, um, maybe next season, and we can really get into some more, um, you know, kind of specific. I know a lot of times when people look up stuff, they're looking for a specific problem they're having, so I kind of like to do that where we're, we're just kind of talking about it. And so we'll, we'll have you back on the show soon because we wanna, we wanna kind of tackle this. And so, can, but real quick, can you just let us know, do you do phone consultations? Um, how people can I get really a hold don't. of you? You don't? Um, okay. No. Um, it's it's probably I'm hard. So busy yeah. Running HerbSmith and developing new products and trying to educate people. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, I would I tend to work with the veterinarians, okay. or I would work like with a nutritionist like you guys. Um, okay. I would work with you to help you assist you with your client. With a client, okay. Um, yeah, that would be the best way. But I would say that we do a lot of um, just emailing back and forth. Okay. So we get people that will send us emails of this is what's going on. And then I will say, you know, we need to do blah, 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 blah. And then send them to people like you guys okay. to do the follow up to, you know, continue to encourage that they're on the right path because the path is longer, you okay. know, and it's, it is. It it's is. not as quick as just giving a pill and having them get better. Um, so no, we, we don't really do phone consultations, but we do a lot of emails back and forth to try to direct them to the right people. That's what I was going to say. I'll get a list from you and put it on our show notes of the veterinarians that you work with so that I can send yep. clients to those vets and then they can work with you kind of that way. Um, yeah, there's a really great, um, the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Society and the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society, we'll get all those um, awesome. names to you. And they have lists of trained veterinarians. So they're veterinarians plus they're trained in herbal medicine or Chinese medicine or homeopathy. Okay. And they're, they're trained in more alternative medicine. And then people can find a trained practitioner in their area. Awesome. Mm. So um, for our listeners, Dr. Besant also makes, I told you, she makes a group of herbs called Herb Smith. And she also actually makes a um, dog food called the Simple Food Project, which I am a huge oh, supporter of. that's you? Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> fabulous. My dog loves that. I didn't know that was you. <laughs> yes, yes. So well, I, felt like, I, I felt like, what would I feed my dog? I'm going to feed her absolutely the best. And it's so wonderful. We literally own the facilities, and I literally see the livers and the meats and we make sure it's of the highest quality. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really amazing. So for, for my clients who have been in the store or for anybody listening to this who also is thinking and considering about moving, removing kibble from your, your stores, I was in a, a tur little turmoil about how I would do that. How do I remove kibble and still provide that convenience part of the argument that clients would argue, you know, they don't have a big enough freezer or they travel a lot. And so there and was the this expectation of right. I can just so there was this struggle. And then I found the Simple Food Project and it became um, a pretty much a mainstream for me in in the spa so that we could. So I, I want you to know that 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 product is amazing. It is if you want to put your pet on a good food, just like Dr. Besant is telling you, you don't want to have to find yourself needing all of these herbs to fix the problems. You want to start. And so this is where she set you up for success. Like she's starting you with a good food and that's what you want to do. And it's also very convenient. So and it, appealing. We, we yeah. when dogs stay with us, that's what we feed. That them. is our house and food. No matter. I don't know if you know that, that's but great. it was funny because when we when we first decided to remove kibble, we were still you know in the process of removing it from our house food as well because originally we were sell, we were we were using a kibble for house food, and I argued in my head, well, they're only eating it for the weekend, so it's okay. Um, but then when I pulled it, I said, I can hardly say, well, you can't feed it, but I'm going to feed it here in the back. And so we started now, Simple Food Project is our house food, um, which has been amazing because then people are like, well, what were you feeding him? Because now he won't eat right. his kibble. <laughs> well, and no matter what they come in eating, you know how some dogs have trouble changing foods. I, 
I mean, pretty much all yeah. the dogs eat it regardless right it. of what they're they go used right to, to eating. And we know we're yeah. giving them something healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can hardly be nutritionists and be feeding, you know, cereal in the back. So yeah. it's been awesome. Yeah. So make and sure all the vegetables are organic and mm -hmm. yeah, Sarah is is yeah, it's it, strong about making sure that we have the highest her. quality of everything. Go, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what is the best website that they can reach you at? If you're interested in the Simple Food Project, um, go to simplefoodproject.com. And the other is Herb Smith, and it's Herb Smith, H-E-R-B-S-M-I-T-H-I-N-C. Com. Okay. Okay. And we have contact us um, pages on both of them. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. I think we have a chat a chat box on them as well. Um, and oftentimes we're going to say we're going to suggest Simple Food Project and something else that's from Herb Smith. And the nice thing is the fulfillment is in the same place awesome. in um, right outside of Milwaukee. So um, we we'll usually send it all together. Awesome. But go to Simple Food Project and, and go to um, HerbSmithInc.com. We also have Facebook pages as well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Make sure you guys follow them there. So thank you so much for being here, Elizabeth. Thank you also for helping me. Oh, and, it was and my and enormous these... pleasure. What an honor to meet you. I, I'm thank you. just really, really impressed by your knowledge. And yeah. do you, do, Have you authored any books? You know, we're um, in the process of writing right now, but um, I, I haven't actually authored a book yet, but thank you. For I mean, I will <laughs> buy it. Tell me when it's out. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to say goodbye. Thank you so much to our listeners. Please make sure to like us and share us. We can't continue the show without followers. Um, it's very important to us to make sure that we can get our um, guest, ho guest hosts on here as well as our experts on here. So make sure you follow the SPA, T-H-E-S-P-A-W, and also follow the SPODcast, as you know. Um, and please like and share us, and we will see you later. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.